Welcome to Watchmen on the Wall, a daily outreach of Southwest Radio Ministries and SWRC.com. Have you heard of God's Threshold Covenant? If you haven't, you're in for a roller coaster ride of biblical discovery that will enhance your understanding of God's Word and its application to your daily life like never before. Here's our host, Dr. Larry Spargimino, with today's guest, Carl Gallops. We're going to talk about a new book by Messianic Rabbi Zev Parat. Rabbi Parat has been on the show before. He's just a tremendous man of God, a tremendous writer. Now, the title of the book that we are offering on these two shows is Blood Alliance. The rest of the title is, and listen to this because it really describes what's in the book, Yeshua's Threshold Covenant and its impact on you in the midst of our prophetic times. It's really a very, very important book written by a very dynamic and spirit-filled Messianic rabbi, Zev Parat. However, Rabbi Zev Parat is in Israel at the present time, and he cannot do an interview. He's right there now ministering Christ to those people in their time of need. Please pray for Rabbi Zev Parat. Please pray for Prime Minister Netanyahu and the IDF and all of the people there at this time. And I really mean it. Not only the Jews, but also the Palestinians, everybody. I believe that Jesus loves them all. So like I said, Rabbi Parad is not with us. However, Zev's dear friend is with us, and he has been on our program many times before. I'm speaking about Pastor Carl Gallops. He is going to do these interviews. And so, Pastor Carl, thank you so much for willingly taking this responsibility on your shoulders, all the extra work, and the time with me. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Brother Larry, for, for your kind, kind words. And, and as you know, and probably some of your listeners know, Zev and I are very close. We've been in ministry together for years. We met through a book that I had written over a decade ago. He was in it. I actually referenced his ministry, what I had seen on the internet, and some videos. And I don't want to get all into that book, but he called me out of clear blue from Israel one day and said, who are you? <laughs> and so we, we hit it off that day, and I told him when we hung up, I said, you know, I just have a feeling from the Lord that you and I are going to do some ministry together. Well, little did I know what a prophecy that was, because within months we were doing ministry together online and videos and interviews, right. but then he came to the United States, we were writing books, we wrote a book together through Defender Publishing, we co-authored a book. We were doing interviews all over the United States. We became very close. We lived in motel rooms together for weeks at the time over here in the States. I've been to Israel with him. We've done tours. We've become very close. So anyway, the two books that he has written completely, you know, by himself. In other words, he helped me write a couple and co-authored mm -hmm. one. But it was the Unmasking the Chaldean Spirit. That yes. was prior to this one. And then now this one, Blood Alliance. In both of those, he asked me to write the forwards for them. So I did, but I read every word of the book. Mm -hmm. I just, I love what he writes and, and his insight. And so on this one, Blood Alliance, not only did I write the forward, not only did I read every word of it, but he actually asked me to write, I don't know, four or five chapters that are in this book. And he actually gives me credit for it in the book. Yeah. And I asked, I told him, I said, you don't have to do that, brother. He said, nope, nope, you're writing it. So... <laughs> I'm going to give you the credit. And then I helped him do a lot of research. He has helped me do a lot of research over the years for my books because he speaks Hebrew as his mother tongue. Yes. So anyway, that's my, you know, the depth of my knowledge of his ministry and his life and his family and also the books he writes. So that's why I was willing to do this interview for him in, since he can't. And thank you for having me on. Yes, you are just the person for, for the interview. Pastor Carl, would you give us an update on what you are hearing from Rabbi Zev Parat right now in Israel, and what is Rabbi Zev doing at this difficult time? I think he's ministering. What a, what a tremendous job. So yes. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, Rabbi Zev has deep ties to the Orthodox rabbinical community, deep ties to the Israeli government, and especially Benjamin Netanyahu's government through his mother's side. In fact, they're people in his mother's family that hold high positions of importance within the Israeli government. Plus, Zev has deep connections to the IDF, of which he, of course, was right. belonged and was an officer, etc. 
Plus, he was born and raised in the most orthodox community, B'nai Barak, of Israel. His whole family line are orthodox Jewish people, and his father and grandfather and great-grandfather were orthodox Jewish rabbis and members of the Diane, the rabbinical courts. Right. So he's deeply ingrained in Israeli life, which gives him the ability often to move about relatively freely when others cannot. That happened during COVID, when they pretty much put the whole country down, locked down, but yet Zeb was given a special pass during COVID to get out among the people. And the reason is because he ministers to people. He takes food, he takes clothing, he gives relief and aid. And, you know, of course, he's able to, to speak about Yeshua when he can. The Orthodox don't like it that he's now a believer in Yeshua. <laughs> they don't like that at all, but they do love him and his family. So, yeah, so in, in relation to what's happening with the war, it's the same thing. He's able to get around a lot. He knows a lot of the IDF guys, you know, the roadblocks and stuff, and they let him through, and he knows people in the government and the Orthodox community. So he goes from the north end of the country to the south end, doing all of these things, ministering Yeshua. Plus, he has house churches. He always has, because he leads a lot of Jews to the Lord. And those guys, they, the men and women that are Orthodox, a lot of times their family denounces them, disowns them. Some of Zev's family has done that to him. Right. So they have to meet him private. They can't just go to a Christian church somewhere <laughs> in Israel, you know. And, and so, so he has house churches, and he travels the whole length of the country. And he's got people that help him, that, you know, believers that he has discipled. He's kind of a modern-day Apostle Paul, you know. And, wow. and he's just got little churches everywhere, and he just goes. And he has Bible studies and prayer meetings, and he ministers to people, and he counsels with people. So that's what he's doing even now. The, he and his wife live in Tel Aviv. Of course, Tel Aviv has been hard hit by this, yes. and it's still being hit. I talked to him just a couple of days ago, and he said, Carl, the news cycle in America has basically forgotten about us. He said, we're still at war. He said, helicopters and jets fly over me all the time. Shelling comes in, bombs and missiles still come in. We've lost a couple of dozen IDF soldiers in the war. Gaza is under siege. Israel has surrounded it. They're inside of it now. He said, it is tough, and we're being threatened all the time. Missiles are coming in from Hezbollah in the north. They're still coming in from Gaza area in the south. Iran is threatening to, you know, to basically nuke us. We've got U.S. aircraft carriers out in the Mediterranean. He said, this is tough. This is war. Right. And he said, but many, many mainstream media sources in America have, quote, moved on. They don't even talk about it. And he's right. I have to look hard and long to find any late news on the Israeli war, Israeli-Gaza war. Right. And, uh, but so that's, that's what's going on, and that's the very latest I heard from him. I did get a text from him this morning. Here's the problem with communication. A lot of uh, communication services are very sketchy. I, I don't know if missiles are hitting communication towers right. or if the government, Israeli government is kind of seizing priority of those. I don't know what's going on, but I know sometimes before I could, you know, say, hey, man, call me. And in 10 minutes, right. he'd call me from Israel. Now I say that, and it might be two or three days before I hear from him. So that's what's going on right now. But he is out, he and his wife, they're in the midst of it all, ministering to people. Wow. Well, thank you so much for that. And I do want to encourage our listeners to uh, remember Rabbi Zev. Uh, what, a, what a great man of God. Thank you for sharing that. Pray for him. Pray for, for the work of the Lord in Israel. These are critical times, people need the Lord. And certainly we can enter into that by lifting these wonderful people up in prayer that uh, they will be safe, that the Lord Jesus will be glorified, and the gospel will go forth in great power. Now, Carl, let's, let's focus on the book. Talk to us about Blood Alliance. What does that mean? Okay, yeah, well, thank you. And I'm honored to do this. Yeah, well, Blood Alliance is really another way of talking about the ancient threshold covenant concept that is in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, literally, and I'm not misusing the word literally. And, and Zev's whole book is about that. And as I said, he asked me to write several chapters and do a lot of research. So I've learned a lot from him and the research. And then, of course, add that to what I already knew, 
Zev's book is just amazing, and it had nothing to do with what I wrote, but I'm just saying I've read it from cover to cover because I was so infatuated with it. But Blood Alliance speaks of that ancient threshold covenant idea. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking down to anybody. I don't know your audience, what they know about this. Some of them will know everything about this, and some will know nothing about this. So I'm just going to start with the fundamentals, but I don't want your audience to think I'm oversimplifying it. Right. Bottom line is the book is detailed. It's heavily referenced. Zeb is not pulling anything out of his back pocket and just giving a bunch of opinions. This is well-studied, well-thought-out, well-written, easy to read, even though it covers a lot of material. But it's all referenced with historical sources, archaeological sources, scholarly sources that go back to the ancient Jews, come right into modern Christian scholarship, and even the classical Christian scholarship. There's a lot of writing on this. And so the bottom line is this threshold covenant idea, it, 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 it goes all the way back, and we have archaeological evidence of this, historical evidence of this. Even before the biblical writings, the cradle of civilization, the oldest form of worship on planet Earth was this thing that we now call the threshold covenant. Now, it, it, it required a blood sacrifice. Now, first, just think about that for a moment. And Zev's understanding, and a lot of scholars is, that these ancient pagans, basically, it started with the the true blood covenant, the true, you know, Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It, it started with the truth, the Passover coming out of Egypt. What they do, they take a lamb and slay it and put the blood on the doorpost. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But we see it in the Bible. The very first biblical instance of a threshold covenant or a blood alliance was in Genesis with Abraham when God says, listen, from you, your firstborn son, of course, he meant the legitimate son, Isaac, will be, he will be the father of, and you and he will be the father, your seed through your seed will come a great nation. And then it goes on, you know, and whoever blesses you, I will bless, right. whoever curses you, I will curse. Okay. But Abraham says, well, how will I know this? How will I know that this is really going to happen? And God said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Now, this is interesting. And he told him, he said, take a Take a heifer, take a, a ram, a, a male lamb, take a pigeon, take a dove, cut them in half and put them on this line to have a line in the middle. You walk through this sacrifice. You walk through this trail of blood, and I will honor, and we will make a blood covenant together, a blood alliance, basically. That's the oldest picture of this in the Bible. Now, what was happening was God was telling him, look, all of this, my promise is given to you in a covenant format. Covenant is going to be in blood. Now, I don't know how much he told Abraham, because the Bible doesn't record every detail, but what God was getting at was, and I, one day, myself, am going to put on flesh. I, myself, will be the word that becomes flesh. I, myself, will shed my blood, Zechariah 12 says, and on that day you will look upon me, says the Lord, yes. whom you have pierced, and you will, you will mourn for him as an only son. And on that day, chapter 13 says, a fountain will be opened in Jerusalem, and whoever gets under that fountain, their sins will be forgiven. Well, we, we know that was the ultimate blood covenant, the ultimate Blood alliance, the ultimate threshold covenant, and I'm going to explain what threshold means in a moment, but it goes all the way back to Abraham walking through that blood covenant line of those animals that God directed he bring and to split them open, to cut them open and lay them out, and then he was to walk through the blood. Now, that's where our English phrase, cut a deal, comes from. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cut a deal with you. Cut. Cut a deal. What does that mean? That's what God did with Abraham. I'm going to cut a deal with you. Now, he didn't say it like that, but that's where we yes. get the phrase, to cut a deal. And, and so, so it, it's ancient, ancient. Now, we have archaeological remains, brother, in the, in the, in, from Egypt all the way around to the Fertile Crescent, all through there, of... Ancient, ancient, uncovered homes from ruins and digs that go back to the biblical times where 
in the threshold of doorways is a groove. In fact, it's often called a groover. Sometimes the Bible calls it a basin, and people misunderstand that in the English when it says put the blood in the basin and dip it and put it on the lintels and the doorpost of your home. But the word basin in the English is not a bowl. That's what a lot of people think. But it literally, and so many scholars know this. Zev knows it. He knows Hebrew. He knows the nuances of words. And what it means is put it in the groover. You take a lamb. You sacrifice it. You take some of the blood. You put it in the groover on the threshold. You take a hyssop branch and you dip it in the blood. Most translations say that's in the basin, but that is the threshold. You put it on the lintel. That's the top. Then you put it on both sides of the doorpost, and then you got blood at the bottom. What does that look like? It's a cross. It's a blood-stained cross. Wow. Blood at the top, blood on both sides, blood at the bottom, and what's in between the blood? A doorway. And you have to go through the correct door that's under the blood of the cross, if you will, and it's a lamb. It's a lamb's blood. Then God's wrath will pass over you on the night he brings that plague upon Egypt. There's the first picture of a real threshold covenant that God made. He's always made blood covenants with his people living in Satan's world ever since it was stolen in the Garden of Eden. It's Satan's world. So God has made blood covenants. He's basically saying, I'm willing to take a, a bullet for you. In our modern world, I would say, if I would take a train for my children and grandchildren. Yeah, I mean, I, I would let a train hit me. I, I will, you know, I would go to a cross for them. And that's what God is saying in these blood covenants. He Amen. says, look, Amen. you're going to take this lamb, and you're going to choose it on the 10th of Nisan, the first month. And then you're going to keep it to the 14th. Well, a lot of times the kids played with the lambs. They knew the, the, the livestock was their life. And a lot of these kids knew these little lambs. And then they brought them in for four days, and, you know, and then they killed it. And then they put the blood all over the door. And, you know, so this whole ritual was God's way of saying, listen, I'm going to save you, but it's going to be costly to you. And you're going to see that it's by the blood, and you've got to go through the door. Now, jump into the New Testament. What did Jesus say? I am the door, and nobody Amen. comes into my Father's house under his protection unless you come through me, the real door. Well, how do we come through Jesus? Through his blood shed on the cross. The whole Passover was a picture of Jesus, and there is an example of a threshold covenant. You find that idea all the way through the Bible, even to the book of Revelation. You find it several times in the New Testament. I'm going to stop and let you weigh in because I've got much more I can say. But his (laughs) book is about all of that and how it impacts our life and how it addresses what's happening in the world right now, right down to the Israeli war. Amen. Well, the book is Blood Alliance. It's a 390-page paperback. The book will certainly help you see and discern the Blood Alliance theme throughout the Bible. Carl Gallup, thank you for fielding questions. We're looking forward to uh, having you back again with us, and you do such a great job. God bless you. This is such real, real stuff. And friends, I really want to push this book. This book is tremendous. You can have it uh, by calling our 800 number, 1-800-652-1144. Pastor Carl, we're looking forward to having you back on the next show, on the next broadcast. So, friends, be sure to tune in. And I can tell you, we're just starting to get into a tremendous topic, a tremendous show. God bless Carl Gallops. Carl, I know you're taking this as a little bit of extra work on you, but we really appreciate you being with us. You're so eloquent. And above all, you know Zev Parat in person. God bless you, brother. Thank you so much. It's my honor to do this, sir. I look forward to the next show. Carl Gallops has more to share concerning God's threshold covenant coming up now. Here's our host, Dr. Larry Spargiovini. This is part two of the interview on the book, Blood Alliance by Rabbi Zev Parat. Rabbi Zev is in Israel and not able to be on the show, and Pastor Carl Gallops explained that to us in our previous interview, which is archived, swrc.com. If you didn't listen or if you 
you said, wow, I can't digest all of that. I want to listen again. Well, just it is archived on swrc.com. Pastor Carl Gallups has worked with Rabbi Zev. He is our resource person who is sharing with us some of the profound biblical truths in the book, Blood Alliance. Pastor Carl Gallups, thank you once again for sharing with our listening audience. Oh, it's my pleasure, Brother Larry, and uh, I'm honored to do this. Thank you for having me. It's a, a tremendously rich book. Like I did mention in our previous program, 390 pages, but it's the kind of book that that you can keep on going back to, thinking about, reading about, and praying over, because I believe it is, uh, Zev has really been anointed by the Holy Spirit to reveal all of these things. But Carl, how are the seven feasts of Israel related to Threshold Covenant and even the Sabbath itself? Yes, yes, and, and, and I appreciate you asking me that. That encompasses three or four or five chapters of Zev's book. It's very important. So the seven feasts of the Lord are laid out in Leviticus 23. I tell people, the seven feasts of the Lord, they're not the feast of the Jews, they're not Jewish feasts. These are feasts of the Lord given to Israel and to all who believe, even modern-day Christians, if they understand it. The problem is we have this big, huge dearth of, the, <laughs> of misunderstanding of, about the Word of God. But let's go back. Leviticus 23, all seven feasts, they make up the skeletal structure of the whole Bible. They all tell the story and the gospel of Jesus Christ right up to his coming again. The Feast of Passover is the first one. Of course, that when Jesus was crucified, the blood of the Lamb, the ultimate threshold covenant, the blood covenant there. Okay, so the Feast of Passover. Then the next is Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, Jesus is our unleavened bread. He is the, the bread of life. And then the next one was the Feast of first fruits. Paul says, he is the firstborn from the dead. He is our first fruits. Okay, then the Feast of Pentecost. Well, that's when the church was born and the giving of the Holy Spirit. The Jews to this day celebrate Pentecost. One of the things they celebrate is that it also was the birth of Israel at Mount Sinai by the giving of the law. So they celebrate that. The giving of the law, Israel was born. We celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit. The church was born. Who did all of that? Jesus Christ himself. So there's that. Then the last three fall feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, which are sounds of warning, calling people together. There's a battle coming, the arrival of the king. You blow the trumpet. And then ten days later is the Feast of Atonement. Watch this. If you're under the blood that has been sacrificed properly by the great high priest then God will pass over you, the nation of Israel again, year by year by year. He will protect. But if they turn from him, if they worship idols, if, if, they take, if they don't take seriously the worship services of the temple and all that that represents, then God's hand is removed from them. So we see all of that through the Bible. And then the last feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, celebrating coming out of Egypt and dwelling in the wilderness with God in their midst, living in tents and whatever, the tabernacles. Then the tabernacle in the wilderness, the ancient temple, it celebrates all of that. So those are the seven feasts. But watch, when you come to Leviticus 23, it begins by, and they're Hebrew words, and, and Zev goes through this, they're called moeds in Hebrew, the moed, that would be the feast, the festivals, the celebrations, and then it says these days are to be a mikra for you, mikra, and in, in the English it would say, and these are to be holy convocations, and that word mikra means, watch this, rehearsals. So every one of these feasts are lived out in the ancient agricultural society and the worship society of the ancient Jews. But God declares in Leviticus 23, these are merely rehearsals for the ultimate fulfillment that's coming in Jesus. Now watch, before he goes to the seven feasts, he starts with, now honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, for it also is a moed unto you and a mikra. What? The Sabbath? is a day that is a rehearsal for what? Here comes Jesus. What does he say? All you who are weary and heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you Sabbath. Amen. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. One greater than the Sabbath is here. One greater than the temple is here. I, Sabbath, was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath and I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So in Leviticus 23, there's a picture of Jesus 
as being the head of all the seven feasts. He, the Sabbath. It will be fulfilled in Jesus. By the time you get to the book of Hebrews, starting in chapter 4, it says, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it basically says, if you are in Jesus Christ, you are keeping the Sabbath now. He's the fulfillment. It can be any day you want. Remember, it should be every day. He is the Sabbath. We are now in Him. It's no longer about a singular day or a 24-hour period, and, and then we go on with our lives. No, it's about now being immersed in the life of Jesus Christ. He is our Sabbath. He is our Sabbath rest. Then the ultimate Sabbath, the book of Hebrews says, is when the Lord returns, and we are then in the new kingdom with him and, and, and serving him for all he's going to do for eternity. So the bottom line is all of these connect together under the head Jesus Christ. The pictures of Jesus are all through them, but more importantly, the threshold covenant. Amen. They all start with Passover. The threshold covenant, the blood of the lamb was put in the threshold, a hyssop branch was lifted up and put the blood on the top and the sides and the bottom. There's the picture of the cross. There's the door you have to go through. It all starts with the threshold covenant. And each feast of the Lord, you're stepping over another threshold of another inside door that's inside the Father's house. Think of this. All through the New Testament, we are told that if we are believers, we are part of the household of God. Well, how did we become a part of the household of God? We had to be invited in. But we couldn't go in until we stepped over the threshold, which was filled with blood. Amen. And that's the covenant. The covenant was, if you and I we're going to do some business together or maybe we needed to forgive each other or some big deal was happening, I would ask you to cut a covenant with me. I would ask you to participate in a threshold covenant with me. As people, this is the ancients did this. So what would that mean? I would take a lamb, I would slaughter it, you would come to my house, you would come to my house, and you would come through the front door, and you would see the blood of the lamb in that little groover right there, and you would step over that. You wouldn't trample on it, Hebrews says, but if you don't come to Christ, you're trampling on the blood of Jesus and, and making him be crucified all over again. That's what Hebrews is talking about. You're stepping on the threshold, or you're rejecting it. But see, if you and I are making that covenant, you would step over it in honor. You would come into my house, and then that animal I sacrificed, we would eat of it together in my house. Now you've stepped from outside my house, from one world, to inside my house, into another world you've never been in, and you had to come over the blood. That whole picture is through the Bible for those of us that belong to the Lord God, we have to come into the household of God, to my Father's house. We come through the door. Jesus said, I am the door, and I shed the blood, and I am the lamb slain Amen. before the foundation. Does all of that make sense? Well, friends, there are so many important lessons in the book, Blood Alliance. You will learn what the Sabbath is really all about. We've just heard about that and how the threshold covenant brings it to life. And you will also learn about spiritual warfare and about the diabolical influence of the Chaldean spirit. All of that in the book, Blood Alliance. You can have your own copy by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-652-1144. This is a well-written, well-documented, 390-page book that will take you into another world. Give us a call, 1-800-652-1144. Carl, I wanted to ask you something I think is very, very important. How has the Threshold Covenant been perverted by the Easter spirit. Yeah, now we could do four hours on that. Let me give you the, the quick emptying of fire hose into your mouth edition, okay? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Again, I'm going to tell your listeners, go to the book, read those chapters. It will blow you away the depth of the historical, biblical, researched, verified research that he's done. But here's the bottom line. Passover is the ultimate. It's the ultimate threshold. Okay, it's all about Jesus. The, the problem is it falls in the same time as the spring rituals and the spring rites of the ancient pagans. And here's what he writes about. And see, Satan's behind this. He's trying to destroy. See, marriage is a threshold that God has set up in the Garden of Eden. Okay? But what has the world done? We've stepped all over the blood that made that covenant of man and wife. We've changed the idea of marriage. We've changed the idea of gender. We've changed the idea of is there life in the womb. 
all of those are covenants. They're blood covenants. We've, we've stepped over and perverted them. Well, one of the biggest threshold alliances, threshold covenants that Satan has perverted is this understanding of Passover. And Christian churches bring in now, and they use the word Easter continually, Easter services, Easter this, Easter that. Some churches even advertise Easter egg hunts, Easter bunnies. You come to church, see the Easter bunny. I mean, it's crazy. What you discover through this book is that, listen, it's about Passover. It's about Jesus. And people say, oh, we know that. We just call it Easter. But here's where it comes from. The ancient Canaanites became known as the Phoenicians when they built boats and started exploring the world. They went wound up in what we now know as Great Britain. It was the, the Britannia Islands, and the Phoenicians landed there and brought their worship of Baal and their worship of Ashtoreth and Ishtar, the goddesses of fertility, and Baal, the lord over all things, which was a pagan god trying to, demon trying to say he was God, probably Satan himself, that was all brought into the, the, those islands. The Phoenicians seized those islands, brought their gods there. Why? Because the Britannia Islands were filled with tin, T-I-N, and tin mines. And so that metal was important to the Roman Empire that would later conquer the Britannia Islands. And the Roman Empire inserted all of that Baal and Ashtoreth and Ishtar. And then they actually, the, the celebration of what we now know, the Latinized form of the word, is Easter, Esther, that was brought into the Roman Empire, and all during spring, that was the big thing throughout the Roman Empire. So when the church was born, they didn't celebrate. They didn't call it Esther and Ishtar and Easter. Uh, but the Romans, during that same time, were doing all of their pagan rituals and parades and, and celebrating, you know, that's where the bunnies come from and the eggs, you know, new life. And, and it was very sexual in nature and just like Satan would do, pervert the whole thing. But then Constantine, trying to unite the Christian world in a time when he thought he was about to lose his empire, he put an edict, and it's all in the book, and it's all very fair, very historical, very accurate from reliable sources. I mean, Encyclopedia Britannica and things like that, not back-channel conspiracy sites. But, but, and you can read his edict in his own words where he says, we're going to do away with that Jewish stuff, right. and we're going to celebrate Easter during what the Jews call Passover. I mean, I mean, Constantine says that. It's in his own right. We've got those documents, and Zev has them in the book. So now, today, here we are in America, the largest Christian nation on the planet, and we fill the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus with the talk of Easter. I mean, that's what Satan is up to. He's perverting the threshold covenant, and a lot of God's people are stepping all over the blood. Does that make sense? Right. Well, I, I think... There are some, some really big issues that uh, so many Christians uh, miss today that we just slide over, as you've been pointing out. I think the whole idea of spiritual warfare, I'm thinking of Ephesians 6, 12, is a very, very important concept. We're in a battle, and human beings are not the real enemy. So talk to us a little bit more about the threshold covenant, some of the things that you've been talking about or that Zev Parat speaks about and spiritual warfare, and how that affects us today with the very problems we have in our homes, with the very problems we have in the world, with the situation in the Middle East at the present time. Tie this all together for us. We only got about, <laughs> about two minutes, but I know you're able, so go ahead, brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's a tall order, but here we go. So the whole, the whole thing about blood alliance, it starts in Genesis it goes all the way through to the book of Revelation, speaking about the lamb slain before the foundation and understanding that Satan was trying to kill the male child that the woman gave birth to. That's Revelation 12. Why? Because of this blood alliance, this threshold covenant that was made through the blood of Jesus Christ. It explains everything. And so now we look at our world, and again, I'll just say, marriage, a covenant with God. It's a threshold covenant. We've perverted it. We've perverted maleness, femaleness. We've got a Supreme Court justice, they ask her, well, how do you define a woman? I don't know. I'm not a biologist. I don't know what a woman is. <laughs> and you know, craziness, truth is being thrown to the ground. Children, changing genders of children, that's a blood-bought 
institution that God created, manhood, womanhood, marriage, family, home, childhood, all of these things. The church itself bought by the blood of Jesus. But even that's been corrupted. The church has been corrupted. Israel, the book of Zechariah, talks about the last days. Jerusalem and Israel would be attacked by a coalition of nations. Ezekiel 38 talks about it. But in Ezekiel it says, I will make Jerusalem a stumbling block for the nations, and they will reel over it. Well, that word stumbling block, that's one English translation. But the Hebrew, the word means threshold. I will make Jerusalem a threshold for the nations to stumble over. So in other words, he's saying, look, I made my blood covenant with Jerusalem. It's the center of the earth. Ezekiel 5.5 says that. It's the center of everything. It's where the Garden of Eden was. It's where Adam and Eve were created. It's a, it's ground zero. It's where Jesus is coming back on the Mount of Olives. It's where he left on the Mount of Olives. It's where he was crucified. It's where he was resurrected. And in the last days, Satan is going to get these nations together to come against Jerusalem. They're going to try to destroy and stomp on the threshold covenant I made with my people, but I will destroy those nations. Wow. Wow. So there you go, brother. That that's you did it very well. Thank you so much uh, for these two uh, interviews. I believe that Rabbi Zev would be very happy with these programs, and we will certainly want to pray for Rabbi Zev Parat and his ministry in Israel during these troublous times. And once again, God bless Carl Gallops. Thank you, Brother Larry. I, I, I really appreciate it, and I'm honored to be here. God bless you. The complete two day presentation by Carl Gallops.